Uh, Wayne, your presentation focused on what we've learned in the past 20 years about cannabis and health. What do we know now that we didn't know then? Well, not so much we didn't know then. We strongly suspected uh, there were adverse health effects back then, but the evidence wasn't clear. I think we, the two things that are clearest now are one about the acute effects of using cannabis, particularly if you get behind the wheel of a car, it does increase accident risk. Something users need to be aware about and we need to respond to as a public health concern. And the other uh, concern is more about regular sustained, say daily use or more frequently, that that's a pattern of use that uh, increases the risk uh, considerably that people will develop dependence on the drug. And it's the dependence on cannabis that tends to be the pattern of use most heavily associated with a lot of other adverse psychosocial and mental health outcomes. And I guess the irony there is that, that you've um, only been able to learn this because there have been smokers who have um, a, a use career now extending to 20, 30 or more years. Yes, and uh, the best of the studies comes here from New Zealand, from the Dunedin and Christchurch uh, birth cohort studies, which you know, by happy accident uh, commenced at a time when young people were uh, taking cannabis use up at fairly high rates and uh, the substantial proportion of people in both those studies were regular users so it enabled the researchers to follow the effects of adolescent and young adult cannabis use and assess their impact on outcomes in adulthood. One thing that came out of both those studies was uh, the fact that early onset of use seems to be a particular problem. Yes, I, mean, I think that's probably one of the most clear outcomes of all longitudinal studies, not just of cannabis but of all drugs. The earlier a young person initiates, whether it be tobacco, alcohol or cannabis, the more likely they are to become regular users. It's also the case that young people who initiate early probably have a lot of other problems as well. And I come from socially disadvantaged backgrounds. There might be history of parental uh, drug and alcohol problems or mental health issues or they're performing poorly at school. Uh, so vulnerable young people are more likely to get involved in that pattern of use and I think it's also clear that when they do get involved in that pattern their outcomes are a lot worse than if they hadn't. Uh, how much better are we now able to distinguish between uh, causality and correlation? I think, uh, I mean it, it's always a challenge in observational studies meaning that you've, you're observing the effects of a pattern of drug use that people have chosen to engage in because people who use cannabis as I said earlier are not a random sample of the population. But I think insofar as one can, uh, by controlling for using statistical methods, the effects of these other risk factors, I think both of the New Zealand studies have done a, a very good job of doing that and pointing very strongly to cannabis playing a role in combination with other forms of uh, disadvantage and adversity in producing a lot of these outcomes. What does what we've learned suggest about uh, effective public health approaches? Well, I think we need to do a much better job of warning young people about health risks. That's a challenge because of, uh, you know, I guess, a past history of exaggerated claims about the adverse health effects of cannabis that make people somewhat uh, sceptical about health messages. But I think the message about uh, dependence risk uh, needs to be more clearly made. I don't think it's always appreciated that this is a drug of dependence, like alcohol, like tobacco, like other illicit drugs. Uh, and I think the motor vehicle accident risk is probably a bit of a challenge in front of us in persuading users that it's not a good idea to get behind the wheel of a car after you've been smoking cannabis. Even if you think you can compensate for the, the impairment, your ability to respond in the event of an emergency is, is clearly impaired and you put other people's lives at risk. Obviously one of the problems with, with um, stone driving is um, testing. No tests really work, do they? That's a bit uncertain. I mean, the, what we've done in Australia is, is gone down the route of uh, saliva testing, which doesn't detect, detect impairment per se, it detects recent use. And the courts, uh, well, the, the legislation has defined uh, evidence of recent use as impairment. Uh, I don't know, that, you know, I think that's likely to be challenged sooner or later in the courts. I don't know what the outcome of that would be. And I don't know, I think a critical question as to whether this sort of uh, approach has had an impact, whether it has deterred young people from driving while using cannabis or not. We know random breath testing has worked, but the intensity of that form of testing is much higher uh, than the intensity of uh, roadside drug testing has been in Australia. So it's a bit hard to know, and maybe there's a bit of a, you know, some sort of positive spin-off if people are aware that uh, 
they can be tested for a cannabis related impairment. They might think twice about getting behind the wheel, we don't really know. But it clearly is an important issue uh, for public health research if we're wanting to re reduce the contribution that uh, cannabis as, as well as alcohol makes to road accident fatalities. But you seem to be saying that the, the old style of scare tactics was in fact counterproductive. I suspect it was, it'd be hard to prove that, but um, you know, certainly I think some of the, the claims made in the, in the past about cannabis were uh, you know, exaggerated its health risks and I don't think we have to exaggerate them to uh, make it clear to young people that there, are, uh, there is a downside to cannabis use. I think you know, in the 20 years I've been in the field I've seen you know, a change in the attitude of young people, particularly amongst uh, young Australians. There is a recognition that people can get into difficulty with this drug that wasn't there. Certainly when I was in, at university, uh, you know, when we were very sceptical about uh, any adverse effects. And I think you know, if people see their peers getting into problems with cannabis, they recognise that uh, it can be a drug that has a downside. And I think there's more young people recognise that, and I think we should capitalise on that sort of knowledge in the way we get uh, information across about health risks. Your work also looks at uh, possible genetic bases for cannabis harms. What are the implications of what you've learned there? Oh, it's still early days. I mean, it's mostly suggestive evidence that there's a genetic basis for the type of experiences people have, whether they're positive or negative, from using cannabis. I mean, these are very common sort of genetic uh, genotypes that are out there. So it, it's probably telling people something that they already know, that if you have an unpleasant experience with the drug, it would be a good idea not to use it again. It's a bit like the genotypes that make people very ill if they consume alcohol. You don't need a genetic test to know that you've got the genotype. You just need to drink alcohol. And I think for a lot of young people who've had these unpleasant experiences with cannabis, they don't need to be told to avoid uh, the drug because I think that's why there's a lot more young people who've had some experience with cannabis than there are who've uh, used it uh, reasonably regularly. Can you see a day when people are screened as a matter of course and are told, no, cannabis isn't for you? Been hard to say. I mean, the, the, all the genotyping studies that have been done for risk factors, say for psychosis, for example, there are hundreds of genes involved. Uh, it's unlikely that we're going to find a small number of genes that very strongly predict increased risk. I think we'll be, we can still give good advice to young people, particularly around psychosis, by just saying if you've got a first degree affected relative, you'd be very wise to avoid using this drug. Or if you have a mental health problem, and you've used the drug and it's made it worse, you'd be very wise to avoid repetition. So I think we could still give advice without resorting to genotyping. And I think the best advice would, would depend on family history and uh, personal experiences with the drug. What do we know about the relative risks of cannabis compared to certain other popular drugs? Uh, I think David Ferguson, I think he said this publicly, has described cannabis as a, a grey form of alcohol in terms of a lot of the the health risks. It, it has very similar risk profiles, but on the whole, the, the, the relative risks of developing a lot of these uh, outcomes are somewhat less. So, for example, if we look at dependence potential, you know, the best guess there is you know, about one in 10 people who ever use cannabis will develop dependence on it. That's about uh, two thirds the risk, say, for alcohol or cocaine, and a lot less lower than the risk for other illicit drugs like opiates or for legal drugs like nicotine. Uh, if you're talking about accident risk, uh, it looks like it roughly doubles the, the risk of being involved in an accident for comparable levels of intoxication to alcohol, where the risk is more like six to tenfold higher. So it, it produces some of the same harms, but probably at lower levels of risk. And I think that's probably you know, part of the reason why it's, it's, it's a, acquired a reputation of being a, a less harmful drug than others, but it, it still can cause harm. You used the phrase uh, dependence rather than addiction. Uh, was, that, was that deliberate? Uh, can we talk about marijuana addiction or is it not classical addiction? Uh, well, I tend to avoid preferred dependence for all forms of drug. Uh, it's, see, the, it's the international classification of disease term that WHO uses. Uh, I mean, addiction carries all sorts of connotations and stigma. Um, I, I mean, I think you know, cannabis dependence exists in the same uh, sense that alcohol dependence exists or nicotine dependence exists or opiate dependence exists. Uh, and there is a withdrawal syndrome that's experienced by uh, 
a substantial proportion of very heavy users. Uh, it's a lot different from the sort of withdrawal sy syndrome for other drugs, but I, I don't doubt that there are lots of similarities between cannabis dependence and other forms of drug dependence. It does seem one um, key difference between cannabis and, and alcohol is that most of the people who try cannabis stop using it. Mm -hmm. Not the case for alcohol. Well, I think its illegality has a lot to do with that. Uh, I mean, I think you know, its illegality doesn't discourage people from experimentation. But uh, I think a, a big reason why people stop is because it's illegal. Uh, it's not as readily accessible. It might be if you tend to affiliate with other peers who are heavy users, but for a lot of people. And if you look at the longitudinal data in the US, uh, as you say, when people get into their early 20s, marriage and mortgages and children typically tend to moderate illicit forms of drug use, but people continue to drink because it's available and legal and socially tolerated. And they're much more likely to continue to smoke tobacco as well. So there does seem to be the illegality probably shortens the career of use, uh, and, and that's an underappreciated, um, I guess, benefit of its uh, current legal status. So, in your view, the legal status of cannabis does actually have a positive public health impact? Oh, I mean, it's always hard to argue that, but if you just look at the prevalence of regular cannabis use with the prevalence of uh, regular cigarette smoking or regular alcohol use, it's chalk and cheese. I mean, it, uh, you, you can certainly, if you quote lifetime use, you are getting up 60, 70, 80 percent of young people who've ever used cannabis. If you look at the number of used in the last year, you're usually looking at a half that. If you looked at the la number of used in the last month, it's a tiny fraction again. Whereas if you did the comparable statistics for cigarettes, you know, it'd be you know, sort of 20, 30 percent who've used at all of those sort of levels because people become dependent. And the same with alcohol, you'd, you'd get much higher rates of regular sustained use. And a lot of it has to do with, well, the combination of legality, ease of access and, and social tolerance of, of their use. Wayne Hall, thank you for your time. You're welcome.